Good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Mishevich. Oh, hold on. We, we've just got to protect ourselves. Uh, you can all keep away from my, your screen for a second. If you're going to sneeze or cough, make sure that you do that adverting. We've got to do it that way uh, to make sure you get out of the way. Uh, so please, for the rest of the evening, if you don't mind, uh, I will be coughing and spluttering into my napkin here. Uh, actually, no, let's just remove that. I've operated on uh, Tim already, so his, uh, he looks better now. Um, good evening, everyone. It is the first Monday of October, so thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, what I thought I would do in the first instance is introduce or allow the panel members to introduce one another to you and, and on this fine Monday evening. So let's start with you, Bronwyn. Say hello to everyone. Hi, it's Bronwyn Burncombe here from the Property Investing Foundation. I cannot believe it's October already. How quickly has that, got, that gone the last few months? Amazing. Anyway, it's great to be here to um, be part of this amazing panel. Um, I'm a property investor down in Hampshire and I invest in HMOs, holiday lets, guest houses and some developments. But the best thing about me is I love to help other people learn. So I have an online um, webinar video series i also have a book called property uh, called building your dream life that doesn't work with a green screen does it there we go <laughs> and tonight i'm going to let those who are here live pick up from the chat box a link to get a free copy of my book but not only that you get the five golden rules of property investing so if you'd like that a video of listening to me about the five golden rules then click on the link in the chat box See and that you. is in the chat box as we speak wonderful thank you on to you jenny hello hi i'm jenny Moore holland uh, also from hampshire um i am a, a portfolio landlord we do hmos student lets single lets um and i've uh, been doing it for about 20 years um also a few small developments um and uh other things around property development, such as lease extensions and that kind of thing. So, um, but the key um, the key focus has been operating as a letting agent and uh, and running uh, HMOs in particular. So that's me. I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Jenny, and a warm welcome from me. I'm Paul Hilliard. I'm also a portfolio landlord, uh, but I'm from Birmingham. Uh, not down the south. Yeah, um, I self-manage and I've got a broad selection of clients. Uh, I have single family lets, I've got HMOs, I've got student HMOs and I've got service accommodation units uh, which vary from a one bed bungalow to a 10 bed huge house which uh, fortunately are all fully occupied so celebrations all around. Uh, I've also done a few commercial to residential conversions but only on a small scale so looking for the uh, for the B1 if there's one there come and talk to me. Uh, back in 2012 I found my refurbs were going up in price whilst the products were getting lower quality because I was just being like all landlords watching the pennies and hence unfortunately they needed replacing quicker. I then met a guy called Nick Watchorn, who we all know and love, and found out about LMPG. I joined, and I've helped LMPG grow from 57 members to nearly 5,000. I'm the operations director for LMPG, and if you want to get up to 50% off on your bathrooms, kitchens, boilers, paint, in fact, most of the stuff you need for reefer, then come and join LMPG or come and talk to me. Uh, so ask the question tonight, don't miss out, otherwise I guarantee it will cost you several thousand more just on one re refurb. So that's all from me. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Paul. Um, and can I take the opportunity of saying how much I like LMPG and how many thousands of pounds you saved me? So thank you. Um, to the post. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Um, I'm Tim Bishop. I own a firm called Bananic and Bishop with solicitors. I've got about 60 staff um, and we have a number of specialist teams, but one of them is our property investor team. 
So we act for a huge and growing number of property investors nationwide. It doesn't really matter where they are as long as their property is somewhere in England and Wales. Within that team, I've got 22 people dealing with property work, so convincing of various sorts, five people dealing with lease extensions. We're very uh, specialist on freehold purchase and buying short leases. So if you ever want to know about that, short leases as a, as a strategy, and that is an, an unknown, rather a very little known, but a good strategy, do get in contact with me. And we also have two specialist litigators, property litigators. So we cover the complete area for uh, people up and down the country. I'm also an investor and developer myself. My portfolio includes uh, a commercial conversion, um, which I now have as service accommodation and buy to let and HMO. Um, and also I run a speed networking event for property investors. So if you're missing the face-to-face -face work at investing, because this is great, I love these things, but what I miss sometimes is the actual conversation with other investors. So, so cover the complete area. Yep. So, so we do the cover nationwide. And if you're interested, just get in contact with me. I'll give you the link and you can come along and join us. We do that four times a month. So that's Tim Bishop uh, from Bananica Bishop, solicitors who really understand property investors. Over now to the world's favourite mortgage advisor, Simon Hodgson. Right. Good evening. Right. I've, I've got to keep it short because, um, uh, as the other Simon will tell you, uh, I could easily make this last all the way up to half past eight just talking about myself. And um, surely you don't want to hear about that all night. So, um, I'm a whole market mortgage broker. Um, I started investing back in the early noughties. Um, and uh, back then there was very little in the way of information, knowledge and education. Um, nothing like you know, Bronwyn's course. It, you know, if that had been available back then, the, the amount of money I could have actually saved would have been phenomenal. But what, what would happen is you would learn what you could about buy to let investing then realize that the broker you went to knew absolutely nothing and you then had to educate them on the little about the little amount you'd learn about investing they would then find you a mortgage and then charge you for the pleasure of you giving them advice and building their business for them and that's really why i became a broker um so since then i've gone on to do uh, you know, a full 12 months program under uh, uh, another teaching organization um because i realized my knowledge wasn't as good as it needed to be um and yeah this is what I do as, as a day job. Uh, I'm an investor as well. I've, as I say, I've invested for nearly 20 years, well, over 20 years now. Um, and it's a really interesting market. So from, that's probably all I'm going to say for tonight. For now, I'm going to hand back to uh, the main Simon and uh, he can take the money. Right. Thank you ever so much for the lovely intros. And I have to be honest, there's one person standing, standing out from the uh, panel members, and that's Paul Hilliard with that bright top on. I'm going to have to put some sunshades on. I really am. Um, so as we go through tonight's uh, questions, if you do have any questions yourself, make sure you type those questions in. I've just realized I'm in the dark, which uh, I work at Optimize, and that's often the case. I'm left in the dark. Um, so this probably should be no different. Um, so in regards to the questions, like I say, if you have any questions, make sure you fire those questions off. But uh, we'll start with the question from Graham, and it says here, uh, given the likely forecast conditions uh, correction in the house market, if there is a, cor a correction, uh, is now the time to buy in or invest into buy to let properties or wait until the correction happens? Um, I'm going to go straight to Bronwyn and to Paul Hilliard on that. So, Bronwyn, what's your thoughts? Is there a correction here that's going to happen? Well, there's an awful lot of, uh, of these questions happening at the moment. And I wish I had that crystal ball that we would all love to have. Um, and it depends who you speak to, really. Um, it is all about the economy. It is about confidence in the market. And it's about supply and demand. So, you know, it's a personal thing. I know there are deals everywhere. If you can find motivated sellers and buy below market value, you need to do your due diligence. Of course you do. But if you can find a deal that's going to give you a return on investment that's, that suits you, you do the deal. You do the deal when you find the deal. Now, you know, you can sit back and wait and then find the prices go up. Um, they certainly are near where I am at the moment, going up, not down. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think there will be, well, when we say correction, I can talk for hours about this. I don't think there needs to be a correction. I think it's about confidence and the supply of, of housing in the market. If people all go, hang on a minute, I'll wait till, I'll wait till after Christmas. But the stamp duty holiday has certainly got a bit of a frenzy going out there. So, I'm not, I don't think things are going to 
you know, decline hugely in good employment areas. So that's that's where I'm going to nail my my hat. Is that right, phrase? <laughs> I'm going to put. I'm going to uh, save. So yeah, that's my view. Over to Paul. Thanks, Robin. Uh, I have to agree with you. Uh, the old adage is when's the best time to invest, and it's 20 years ago when the likes of Simon Hodgson and myself and presumably Tim and, and everyone else on this panel were, were starting to buy. Um, good times, but we're not 20 years ago. We're, we're right here, right now. And if you do your due diligence correctly and you're hitting the returns that you expect, I hope you've all got your KPIs uh, for your purchases. And if they tick all those KPIs, then why hold off? You're going to save the uh, stamp duty, which may be up to £15,000, uh, spending on an expensive one. Uh, at the moment, I'm looking at a, a you know the once-in-a-lifetime property, and I think I'm even going to pay slightly higher than what they're asking for. It's because it's it's the right deal at the right time and ticks all the boxes for me. So uh, as long as it meets your KPIs, then I'd say go for it. As regards uh, stamp duty holiday, yes, I feel that come April the 1st next year, we will see a bit of a, uh, well, you, you say correction, uh, I think correction is better than a crash. And But I think there will be definitely a stutter in the market and it will stutter to a, to a halt uh, because Everything's going to be uh, aiming, everyone's going to be aiming to complete by the 31st of March. So if you're going to buy by now, if you're not, and, or if you don't need to, then hold fire because I'm sure there's going to be some bargains next year because there is a lot of landlords who have been uh, caught by Section 24 this year and have just realised, wow, it's going to cost me a lot of money. So uh, if you can, wait. If you can't, then if he ticks the boxes, go for it. Over to you, Sam. Uh, I'm actually going to stick on that same subject because, Tim, you mentioned in the last session that there would indeed be a potential, well, not you, you said there would be a crash, but you, you uh, suggested that there could be a lot of volume going in now, but it might be this whole SELT is covering up the, 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 the a main issue that's going to happen in 1st of April. Do you still see the volumes going up in terms of conveyancing, and do you still feel that Come April, there will be a drop in transactions. Okay, first question first, in terms of sophistication, if I was understood how to use share screen properly, I'd show this lovely chart now, but I can't. So I'm going to give you my really complicated piece of graphics. There we go. That's the average number of convincing transactions we have every month. Um, during lockdown, it went down like that. Literally, it died. We had three inquiries in the first four weeks. Uh, and, and now what's happened, it's gone up like that. And what's interesting is the gap we missed is almost the same as the bulge. So I'll give you an example. We had three inquiries in four weeks. We then took on 180 in the first four weeks, uh, two months ago. So there's a massive change, which is largely, I think, accounted for by the, by the holdup. So I think things are good at the moment and strong. I suspect that the market will come to a frenzy. I think, as Paul mentioned in March, we've seen this before. Whenever the government changed tax rules, everyone has an absolute frenzy. So I think our conveyances are dreading March because people will, will insist on getting done by the end of March. And this horrible, horrible, horrible rush. So, and I think we're going to deal with a question later about why the housing market is slowing down in terms of transactions, and that's relevant. But I do think next year is likely to have some sort of dip, whether it's a, a full crash, whether it's a partial crash, like Bromwin says. At the very least, I think it's going to be in certain sectors. I think people will, will struggle. Um, for example, hotels. Uh, we just had news of someone we know who owns a chain of hotels who's in, in serious issues. And so these perhaps will come onto the market and people may not want to buy them at full price. So I think there'll be particular sectors which will be cheap, but there are also other factors. It's not just coronavirus. We are now in a recession, but because of what the government's done with um, things like uh, the, the furlough holiday, actually, we're not really in recession. It's kind of a false recession. But as that's been taken away, the full impact of a recession will hit. As I said before, the Young Economist has always talked about a 90% economy where the British economy loses 10%, and they're still saying that. It's above the average in some other countries because we're so dependent on services. Um, plus the fact that you're then going to have uh, the, the, the uh, stamp duty holiday removed, plus the fact that whether you like it or not, we've still got Brexit coming up, and there will be a political impact on that. So each one of those things could tick the housing market into recession, which we're already in. So to summarise, no one knows. I think you're spot on. If you have got a bargain now, go for it. But I do think the bargains are harder to find. Auctions, for example, prices are higher. I think at some stage next year, 
probably quarter two next year, which is kind of uh, April to June, July, will be probably the best time. But who knows? No, none of us know for sure. But that's my instinct. And I believe in it so much. I'm not buying anything now. I'm sitting on my hands, picking up some cash to buy next year. But you asked me this time next year whether I was right. Mm. I mean, sticking with that uh, question, I've got another one for you, Tim. But uh, for anyone listening to that, um, Optimize have, have opened up a pharmaceutical so if you need some Prozac or Valium just to get yourself back into a feeling positive again, uh, just contact Optimize and we'll send you your monthly subscription uh, and the first month will be free. Um, Tim, just sticking on that point, uh, why is there a delay with conveyancing? I, I, I personally, I've just sold my house um, and we, we're going to rent an accommodation until we know what we want to buy. But for Lord of money, it's taken nine, 10 weeks to get through the convincing process. Every solicitor you speak to, they've laid people off and then saying, well, we, we're just, the partners are taking on more work. Is that the general consensus? Because I'm seeing a lot of threads talk about convincing. And since you're, you're a legal firm, you've got to take the brunt of it all, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Absolutely. I'm butch enough. I'll take it on the chin. Um, there, there are, I'd say, three issues, and one I'll, I'll pretty, I'd like ask Simon to comment on in a minute. One, I think, is mortgage companies. Certainly, our experience and talking to our conveyances. In fact, the mortgage companies, not the brokers, are slow. And certainly, I spoke to one of them today. What would normally take a couple of weeks is now taking four or five. Again, that's one thing. Secondly, there's an issue with um, uh, with with uh, getting local searches back. Again, every local authority will vary, but certainly we've noticed locally that some of them are getting quite slow. How Hampshire, I know my area with, with um, Bromwood, and that's about three weeks now, but Wiltshire is more like six. And that can really add some time on. It's not as bad as it once was. Wiltshire about five, 10 years ago went up to six months at one stage, horrendous. Um, but there are ways around that with either personal searches or insurance, but that's slowing down the market. But I would say the biggest single uh, slowdown in the market is solicitors. I'm going to say as a profession, a lot of us aren't doing very well. And I would say what's happened is that the profession effectively, particularly conveyances, has been divided into two types. There's type number one, who are reasonably OK. They're, 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 they're coping quite well. They've got technology in place. They've got phones. They've got email. They've got Zoom. They're modern. They've got their staff working from home or from the office or whatever. And they're working reasonably well. Occasional delays, but it's not far off normal, normal standards. And you've got these other transfer firms who are, to be frank, simply horrendous. Um, I spoke to one of my conveyances today and I said, how bad is it for you with some of the other guys? And so she said, give me two or three names. They're good. They're fine, as usual. But she said the others, and she mentioned some names in particular, are just simply awful. And she reckoned in her experience it was 80 percent are in that dodgy tranche at the moment. Why? Well, a number of reasons. Firstly, going back to my terribly complicated graphic, um, we had the, the drop there and the bulge there. So if you've got that number of solicitors, you've now got this massive bulge. Now, we've seen this coming for a while. So we've got a locum. We've also now got two paralegals who I've taken on for six month contracts to do some of the basic stuff. So we're constantly, oh, and also some of our part timers, we've said, would you like to work extra hours now and extra days now and get the extra time off next year where there's likely to be less demand? So some of them have said yes. So we're trying to find ways of giving short term um, uh, relief, I guess. But a lot of firms aren't. Um, they're slow. They can't cope with technology. They laid people off. They've been furloughed. They're trying to cut costs. Um, and some of them simply have no idea how to use Zoom, haven't got the technology they can work from home, and they're simply ghastly. We have some who simply don't email you back. You know, you email, and you email, and you email, and you're waiting. Ghastly. So my suggestion is, if anybody is appointing a solicitor, try to make sure if you can identify that which one of those two. Are they brand A or brand B? If, if you've got a good one, stick with them. If they want a brand B, try to find someone else. And also bear in mind, if you're buying, it's all very well if you've got brand A, but if the other side's got brand B, the slow guys, you're going to be stuffed. So if you can try to persuade the other side to get someone who's sensible, if you know of someone, it's also possible for law firms to act on both sides in certain circumstances, provided there's no, um, there's no conflict of interest. You need to have some sort of barrier between them. So in my firm, we have four offices. So one rule is if you have two people on both sides, number one, they're always in a separate office. And number two, the technology we use shouldn't put a block on certain people so they can't go into your computer records and see what the other side is doing. Uh, but having them in the same organisation means there is more trust. So that can be one solution. 
But I would suggest if you are taking on a solicitor, try to find out from them how quickly they're going to come back. So, for example, if they give you a, a, an automatic quote online, which some do, just you, know, you put a, a figure in and they come back automatically, email them, see how quickly they come back. Give them a call, test them out. And also ask them perhaps what have they done to make up for this huge, huge, and it is a horrible bulge that we're all coping with. How are they coping with that? Um, good firms will tell you they're either doing something or some will actually say, uh, I'm sorry, but we can't help you at the moment because we won't be quick enough. But avoid the ones who want all the work and do it for cheap. Oh, wow. one, one last tip. If you want to speed things up, and this is something I only came across literally a couple of weeks ago. Um, for years, everyone's known to get mortgage stuff through on time. You've got to make sure the banks have your right details. So it's the sort code and the account number. And normally in our experience, that and the name has been sufficient. We have found out, and again, Simon may know much more about this than me, that the last month or so, or perhaps a little bit longer, the banks are getting more and more picky about identifying accounts. And if you don't get the exact wording now of the actual client, uh, the name of the account, they'll often send it back. So once before, you might have got someone's initials and name, and that was good enough. It's now got to be exactly right. Yeah. So for me, being Tim Bishop wouldn't be enough. It would have to be either Mr. T.J. Bishop or Tim Bishop or Timothy Bishop, whatever. Whatever is the correct word on that particular account. Um, and that's otherwise, if you don't get that right, that can add another few days. It'd be Lord Bishop then, right? <laughs> You've heard, haven't you? Oh, obviously, yes. Can I just interject a little bit? So, yes, um, I'm finding that problem where because I'm trying to sell eight new build houses uh, in your neck of the woods, Tim. And um, <clears throat> a lot of them tend to be first time buyers. And so they're going for the cheapest possible solicitors. And, you know, I've had offers back in June uh, at, that still haven't completed. And it's driving, you know, it's actually causing us a lot of problems because we've got development finance on these houses and we just have not. We've, got, we've had altogether seven offers for the eight houses over a period of time. None of them have completed yet. So it's just a nightmare. I, I, I keep Simon. sending them to you, Tim. I keep, I keep recommending you. <laughs> Thank you. And so do the agents, um, because that's the only way, you know, is to get, get a really good solicitor. So, well, yeah, really good. Really good on, on that subject, two things. My understanding is help to buy. And again, this is more Simon's area than mine. Help to buy is being really slow. Government organisations sometimes are slowed even more than private private business. So they can be really slow. So help to buy on the other side, another delay. And lastly, actually, agents are always good to tell you who solicitors are to use. But especially at the moment, the one thing they really, really, really hate is delay and things not going through. So sometimes actually local estate agents, if you want to go local and you don't have to, they can sometimes be a good source of recommendations because they'll know who the ones are good, who are reasonably good, and the ones who you would not want to attach, uh, touch with a barge pole, because there are plenty of them. Just before we go on to Simon Hodgson, I've got a question for you, Tim. I mean, one of the things I was doing is sending weekly emails to the solicitor um, to find out where they were, were in the process. And apparently you can't speak to the other party's solicitor, because obviously there's, there's an issue with that. But would you say that there's got to be some sort of, you know, communication on a weekly basis to say, where are you? Would you recommend that buyers and sellers of property do that every week to chase up where we are in the process now? We try to get all our solicitors, uh, you know, and, and we try to use technology to do it, but it doesn't always work 100% yet, uh, to actually give regular updates every week um, to a agents and coming into clients for a ver ex that exact reason, because that's right. the, the usual complaint because people aren't telling them. But on the other side, it's hard, you know, um, and what solicitors should be, in my experience, doing is if they contact the other side, they should be copying you in as well. I don't see why my firm should be blamed because the other firm is really slow. So actually, I, I'm not going out of my way to dump them in it, but I'm fed up actually having someone shout at me saying, you're really slow, but actually, we're kicking the other side so i think solicitors should have the guts to actually copy in their clients to actually show if there is a problem it's somebody else not them and in which case all you can do you know you, you can phone you can ring but sometimes people don't come back and i'm not sure it's the case now but certainly for the first two or three months we found at least one firm a really really big firm on the south coast who should know better and they simply weren't taking any phone calls at all emails only ghastly you know and of course if they don't answer the email how can you force them to you simply send another email and another email so avoid those kind of firms. And there are a lot out there at the moment. The, the, like a lot of things, coronavirus has really sped up the differences. So it was once it was lots of colours of grey. Actually, it's much more black and white now. So um, it, it is far easier to differentiate between the ones who provide, frankly, a service they should do for the price you're paying and the ones who don't. And, and Simon, from your perspective, obviously taking on board what Tim's been saying, but if you are an active buyer of properties right now, for you, what does slow down the process and what can the buyer and seller do to speed up the process? 
Okay, well, one of the main things, which, which kind of dovetails really nicely into uh, what Tim was saying, is that a number. So, so we've been taught as as uh, investors, as borrowers, to buy borrow as cheaply as possible. So to look at the whole of the market, pick the cheapest lender. Now, quite often, the cheapest lender will throw in th free legals. Now that is, I can, I can see Tim smiling there. It's just. It's the number one recommendation I make to anyone. Whilst this lender is cheap, okay, do look at the component parts of what this lender will do. And if they offer you free legals, and they are offering free legals, just bear in mind that it comes at a cost. And they go, what do you mean it comes at a cost? It's free. Yes, there's the cost. The cost is free because your time is, they are, they are suggesting your time is not valuable. So therefore they will take up lots of your time. And that's been really exacerbated in, in the current situation. Um, lenders who offer free legals, literally, their, their systems are not even bulging. They've broken. You know, the floodgates have gone. And that, that's it. So for me, and also it's become far more apparent over the last eight weeks, six weeks, um, which lenders' service level times have dipped or are dipping. You know, we've got, I've got some lenders who've got service level times of 14 days. That's 14 days just to look at a document you've sent in. Uh, and you're, so I'm forever having conversations with borrowers going, right, well, we could use this lender. And I'm not going to name lenders because that's the wrong thing to do on a platform like this, um, especially if it's going to be you know, recorded and put out on Facebook. But, you know, there are lenders. And if you come to me and you speak to me about borrowing, I will happily tell you which ones not to go to. And which ones to go to uh, and I, I had just that conversation today I, I put, put in front of a, a, a borrower today on a purchase two lenders lender A will give you the cheapest deal okay but you're not going to complete until February maybe March and we might be scrabbling around to get this one in before the stamp duty finishes and they're like what that can't be right I went trust me <laughs> trust me this lender will want to know what you had for breakfast, what your big toe measurement is. If your big toe's different to the, on the left side to the right side, it, honestly, the, the level of questioning will astound you. Um, whereas lender B, a little bit more expensive, but their service level times are sat at four days. Now, four days is still not great. Don't get me wrong, but four days is enough for us to work with. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is that some of the lenders have got systems whereby you put a document in the system and it's 14 days, but you can't backfill other documents behind that document to hold that position in, in the queue. So there's a lot there's a lot going in to try and, you know, yeah, to make it. So that's, that's one of the worst things at the moment, trying to pick a lender that's going to make the thing happen. Um, I, and I don't know, maybe, Simon, the, the, the buyer of your property possibly had free legals included in their deal. I wouldn't mind, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was what happened. Um, mm. Can I come back on one other thing? Sorry to, to, to dominate the conversation and then I'll shut up, I promise. Um, <laughs> one thing is worth, if you're thinking of buying before perhaps some sort of crash next year, going back to the point I made about the uh, holiday, the stamp duty holiday being removed, what will happen is that everyone will want to complete. And as a result of which, the pressure on solicitors is likely to go, go through the roof. So it could well be much, much worse than now. So there will come a stage where we will tell our clients, we can no longer guarantee we'll get you over the line by the end of March. So uh, you, you need to bear that in mind now. So if you think your, your transaction is going slowly, if you instruct someone in February, it's going to be difficult. I'm not quite sure when we're going to have a cutoff. We'll do whatever we can and we may be able to get them through, but we will start warning people. And that's something I think people do need to be aware of. If you are banking on that stamp duty holiday, day you need to make sure the, the transaction moves really quickly and if you've got somebody on the other side who hums and haws with mortgage and you're suddenly finding yourself well into the new year and haven't got very far you may have issues yeah. I, I, I thank you ever so much guys i think it's good to to uh, understand the delays and the issues we've faced but tim mentioned the word fellow and before we all came on to this excerpt on this video live session Jenny, who I'm going to come on to next, so brace yourself, Jenny, um, talked about furlough. And obviously, we are coming to the end of furlough. I think October, November is where start, we'll start to see people be made redundant. Jenny, over to you. From a perspective of a landlord, there are going to be people that is going to be affected by this. So tenants that lose their jobs or 
the, the ones that don't lose their jobs and actually just say, I can't afford to pay you because of X, Y, Z. What is your communication to landlords in this difficult financial period? Well, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, it's we're all it's untested waters. But the advice we're given from professional bodies is to keep uh, dialogue open with tenants. Um, I'm just going to start with tenants because that's where the problem may lay. Um, a lot of tenants are finding themselves in a position they've never, ever been in before, never been out of work, never been unable to pay their rent. And they're embarrassed and they don't want to talk about it because they're embarrassed. They don't know how the system works because they've never been there before. Um, tenants that we have spoken to over the uh, probably last six months or so, some of them we've been able to reassure that there is a, a safety net and help them get into that system um, and knowing that hopefully it's only for short term for them. Um, some of them are quite proactive, others just normal personality types, going to bury their heads in the sand about it, not want to talk to you about it. And the, the tenants we're having the most difficulty with are those that actually won't talk to us about it at all. And we can't force them to talk to us, we can't force them to reply to our phone, phone calls or our emails. But those are the people who are starting to build arrears and we are not really able to do much about it. Now, from a, a us with landlord point of view, obviously we can keep the landlord informed of what we're doing. Um, we have to keep really good records about the kind of things that we are um, doing, speaking. We've got to have a, 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 a paper trail so that if it did come to court, we need to be able to show the court the effect that COVID-19 has had on the tenant and their ability to run their tenancy correctly. Now it's really difficult for us to know how it's affected a tenant. So the only thing we can do is keep asking questions and keep good records of that. But if a tenant doesn't want to interact with you, there's nothing you can do. Um, from a, us with a landlord point of view, we can just keep the landlord informed that we are on it and that we are doing it. We can copy the landlord in, but actually, Mostly they would prefer to have a summary of what's going on. They don't want the day-to-day -day blow of what's happening. Um, but what uh, the situation is, if you do need to give somebody notice, if that's where it's going to end up, and probably these people who won't speak to you are the ones that you are going to have to take to court because you can't actually get anywhere with them at all because they won't speak. Um, if you're going to court, it's a six-month notice period right now. The courts are open again, but of course they've got a lot of backlog. But if their arrears are more than six months, then the notice period drops down to four weeks. So we're going in a di um, using different clauses. We're using section eight rather than section 21s. There's a lot of evidence we've got to put forward. The burden of proof is huge. And, and it's, it's a, mand uh, uh, a discretionary call on the parts of the courts. So we need a good evidence package. We also need to show uh, that we've done everything we possibly can to try and resolve a situation. But at the end of the day, if it goes to court, it's still at the, the, the judge's discretion whether they'll give um, the, the property back. And so it's a very, very uncertain time for landlords. And all we can do is just keep trying to communicate. That's it. Mm. Anyone, any thoughts on that one, Bronwyn? Any thoughts on that one? Well, you know, I use expert agents like Jenny because um, for me, it's it, it, it's a minefield. If you if you don't have if you don't have um, the knowledge about the intricacies of what Jenny's just been talking about, then it's really hard as as an investor um, because you don't know whether you're doing it in the right way. So I always advocate working with experts, but particular specialist experts like Jenny for HMOs, or, you know, people who are also investors themselves who really, really want to get this right. Um, that that's really key and communication that's that's all it is really it's how how can you communicate if they won't respond to you that's really frustrating but there's different ways of communicating sometimes you could even do it on text or Instagram maybe they'll respond at that point you know um, or even a letter through their door under their door you know we've got to try our hardest to be open and honest and that's all we can ask for from them if they're open and honest with us then then we can help them if they're not then you know you don't want it to go to that point really 
Thank you so much for that. That's a good, very good point. And I think, again, it's a sobering comment to make about the, the legal process. I wasn't even aware of the four week thing. I've got to be honest, if you've got six months delays, um, uh, thankfully I'm not in that position. I do have communication tools out with my tenants. So I do know what's going on with them. And uh, from a personal, personal perspective, I think it is about communication two way. Um, as a landlord, I always say, what, what is your current situation? Are you healthy, first of all? And I always start with that. So start a conversation. And then hopefully they'll say, yes, I'm okay, physically, you know, mentally, and all the rest of that. And then we'll, I'll go on to, are you affected by work? And then, again, you start to develop a conversation. So if you're not, if you are a landlord, um, don't see the tenant or, as someone you can't have a conversation with because I think you, you certainly can. Um, just changing subjects uh, slightly, Ali Khan has asked, um, hi all, I've heard that there is a way of reducing CGT, so it's a question for me obviously, um, when selling a property by lending money to a limited company that you own and utilizing different classes of shares. Can you explain how this would work? And I've got to be honest, on that statement, I, it feels like it's a jigsaw piece whereby lots of different jigsaw puzzle games are being put together to assem assemble a picture that doesn't make sense. So forgive me when I say this, but do check your source of information. I bet it's from Facebook, I can only, which I don't go on anymore because it's nonsense, um, or some other sort of forum platform. Um, so the one thing I would say for you, though, is capital gains tax. Uh, if, you're, if you're a basic rate taxpayer selling a residential property, you pay 18% capital gains tax. If you're a high rate taxpayer selling a residential property, you pay 28%. Now, interestingly enough, if you sell uh, a property inside of a limited company, you pay 19% corporation tax. So it is um, less tax, if you like, as a high rate taxpayer, if you use a limited company from that perspective. Uh, but did you know, um, here's one for furnished holiday let uh, property owners. If you sell a furnished holiday let, let's say in Manchester, um, and you buy one in Liverpool, which is the better city for football, um, then what you'll find is that you can get CGT rollover. So you don't pay capital gains tax on the property in Manchester if you're selling for the holiday let, provided that you reinvest that money in a different city. So anyone doing for holiday lets, you do have a beneficial CGT uh, uh, tax break, if you like. Um, so that's that one, and hopefully it's the last tax question that we'll have. Uh, so the, uh, Vic as well, this is on the YouTube live, by the way, these questions. So if you do have questions, make sure that you do type in your questions and because it's live, we will be answering them live. Um, so Vic's asked the question, this is Simon Hudson, by the way. Um, if you have a property portfolio in your own name and you choose to incorporate, so moving properties from your personal name to a limited company, uh, how do you manage current lenders, i.e. mortgages in your own name, but legal ownership moved to a limited company? Simon, go. <laughs> right um okay again that almost sounds like half a question so so generally the process would be that uh and there are a number of different schemes out there for transferring um uh from your own name into a limited company but generally you would probably run within an llp for a period of time so that's a limited liability partnership with which uh not every lender is happy about but there are enough lenders to make it work uh, and then as you transfer them across from the LLP to limited company, um, most lenders or, or the majority of lenders that are worth working with will allow you to li or, or will lift um, early redemption charges and let you transfer into limited company um, as long as you've got a correct set of paperwork from uh, a suitably qualified tax advisor. I can't think of one right at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, However, I think the question suggested um, that it was going straight from or, or being owned in personal name, but uh, the, the liability in, in the limited company, which is effectively signing away the beneficial interest or rights to the property, which in most mortgages under your T's and C's, you are not supposed to do. 
Now, can you do that? And I'm not, I, I would hasten to add anyone watching this, this is not individual tax advice or mortgage advice, okay? This is a generalized comment, okay? Because, it's, because there are many variables to that question. Um, and, and as I say, it could well have just come from Facebook. Um, <laughs> that it, it, you know, effectively, when, if you hold that property and you've signed the beneficial interest away, you then go potentially, let's say, to buy another property using another mortgage lender. Um, you kind of got yourself into a bit of a pickle, effectively, because you will need to demonstrate on a tax return that you've declared tax to HMRC. So the lender will check that. And, and if, the, if the income is running through a limited company, but you're holding it in your own name, you are storing up problems which currently underwriters are absolutely loving, yeah? They, they will do anything and everything to dig up and find a problem. So uh, maybe I've not fully understood that question. Maybe that question hasn't been asked in complete fullness. Um, however, please do reach out to us after the event. We're happy to treat it in isolation and, and dig down to the bottom of it and, and provide you with information. But yes, signing away the beneficial interest of a mortgage, okay, is not something that uh, that lender will do knowingly, okay? Mm. Technically known, uh, I'll give it his proper name, <laughs> mortgage fraud, yeah? You wow, be. mortgage fraud, that's a strong term there, uh, I have to say, uh, sorry, but uh, I completely agree. Uh, <laughs> let's move on for another question. Sticking with you for a second, if I may, um, Let's say that you have a property, you was, uh, and this is for a question from Paul on the who's uh, booked in for a session. Ask a question around about buying a property, um, value of around about 125000 well, is, is the value. They will do some refurb, they'll, they'll get the value to 165000 yeah. um, but the actual purchase price is something like 100000 120000 110 in fact. So if you've got a, a low uh, purchase price, 110, but you know it's worth 160, is there a way to get more mortgage with the 160 valuation? Right, indeed. Okay, I did see this question come in. Um, a lot will depend on the individual's personal circumstances and experience as a landlord at this point. Okay, so I'm going to give two answers. The first answer is if you are relatively new to investing, yeah, you've learned a little bit, possibly you need to learn a little bit more from someone like Bronwyn, okay, and what we, could, what we can then do is to recycle cash. So the idea would be that you probably have to complete at 75% of the value of the purchase price, um, either carry out the works beforehand or afterwards, because I know the question suggested that the works were carried out beforehand under the, a purchase lease option. And then we can remortgage to its open market value. So that involves potentially two lenders. Um, in an ideal world, it should be bridging to start with, okay, which is more expensive. But that is, the, that is you not contravening your T's and C's of a mortgage agreement. Okay. The second way is a little more constructive. It's not as it, I, can you hear me properly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. All right, because my box hasn't gone yellow at this end, so it would suggest you can't. Um, all right, so the second one, right, okay, assumes you've got some property already, you've done some property investing, you are, are uh, considered by a lender to be experienced, okay? You can take out a personal a, a purchase lease option, carry out improvement works to that property, having not owned it, okay? And there are ways, and it's not easy to do at the moment, not many lenders will allow this to happen, where they will allow you to purchase the property and mortgage at its open market value, as long as the mortgage they offer you does not exceed the value of the purchase price plus the cost of the works that you've taken out. At this right moment in time, they will probably hold you to 90% of costs. Okay, it's possible to get 100% of costs, but that's quite hard right in the middle of coronavirus, but it's definitely possible to get 90% of costs, somewhere between 90 and 100% of costs. So if in that instance, value is at 160, new loan of 120, purchase price of 100, and let's say 20 to 25 of uh, refurbishment costs plus some buying costs would maybe take you to just over 130. You might get offered a mortgage at that point of say between 117 and 120. So it can be done. Mm. It's interesting. It's interesting in terms of, I, I, to be honest, that's quite 
innovative in terms of our approach, Simon. I, and that's, and that, by the way, that's just ingenious what you're doing. I, I'm quite shocked by that. Yeah. But it, it's good to know. I think the, the a lot of things I've always come across is you bridge a lot of finance for your redevelopment and then you, you refinance later on down the line. But I think certainly taken from an expert like yourself, uh, you can you can do it in a lot um, of a cost effective way. So thank you ever so much for that. If, if I can add to that, possibly <laughs> take it on even further. Yeah. Um, purchase lease options aren't an easy thing to do right at the moment. However, if you're new to property and, and starting out on the journey, get yourself some education. We know where to get education from. That, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Hold the purchase lease option, let's say, for a, a, an amount of time before you do the works to it. I can then use that that experience of running the purchase lease option as experience to then take on to the lender to show his experience. OK, and, and all along that does dovetails in with, you know, with getting again. I, I keep saying this, get experience. But the, the, you, know, you, you, you can do you dovetail the two by getting education plus doing the property part. Yeah. And then that then takes you on to mortgages. And it's, it's like turbocharging your, your journey upwards. Mm. But don't do it without education, please. please. No, 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 no. Otherwise, it, it can go horribly wrong. Well, once you can tur turbocharge it with, with knowledge, you can also put it <laughs> without knowledge. Yeah, so true. So true. Uh, I'm going to ask a question first of Paul Hilliard and then on to Bronwyn. Again, this is a YouTube live question from Summit. It says, I currently got a deal on an off-plan new conversion. However, there have been so many delays and poor communication from developers. I've got the chance to pull out and invest elsewhere, dot, dot, dot. Do you have experience with this? Uh, Paul, to start with you, um, obviously LMPG sell products. I appreciate that, but you will have connection with tradespeople. Are we having an issue with tradespeople because they, have, they were in lockdown, they've probably not got so many jobs. Now they've got a flurry of work. With all that nonsense going on, how do investors, developers manage tradespeople? If I can just come back and promote uh, LMPG on the previous question. So don't forget, if you're spending 30,000, on a refurb, I guarantee that if you come through LMPG, you'll be spending no more than 25. So uh, that's if you're doing kitchens, bathrooms, boilers, which I'm sure if you're doing a full refurb, you will be. So it's a no-brainer, come and join LMPG. Uh, as regards uh, the trade, the, we've we've had some hum uh, humongous problems on plaster. Plas bags of plaster have been like gold because the only plaster that's been coming through is either Chinese or Turkish plaster. Uh, because uh, British gypsum uh, closed down when the when the uh, uh, lockdown occurred back in March, and when they opened up again because of uh, distance working, they uh, could only open up. I think it was one of their four lines, and it was horrendous. Uh, we know that fact because we worked very closely with our suppliers, and despite our best attempts, uh, we tried to get preference, and we were. We were told that if they do that, they'd be threatened with the legal action by all their builders and tradesmen and everything else. So we, we couldn't pull a, a preference to supply LMPG members on that. So there are issues as regards certain products. And I understand it, it's, it's recovered, but I, I wouldn't say it's fully there. And there was rumours this week that uh, with the lockdown coming uh, threatened in certain areas, they were starting to run out of uh, certain, product, certain products. Uh, the other item that tends to struggle at the moment is fire doors. So uh, that springs to mind. So, uh, as regards being able to pull out of a uh, out of a deal, uh, check the fine detail, which I'm sure Tim or uh, uh, or Bromley may be able to you know comment on that further. But whilst you may think you can pull out, you will probably I'd have thought lose your deposit or whatever amount you paid so far. But again, as I said, don't check that. Um, and obviously, even if you do lose it, if you this new deal that you've got is better, then take advantage of that, I would. Uh, so uh, it's how long's a piece of string? Read the fine detail and then work out if it's worthwhile ditching or, uh, or carrying on. Because the likelihood is, is if you're going on to another off-plan uh, uh, issue, then uh, you might have issues uh, with that new uh, developer having further, further problems as regards tradesmen. Mm. So. 
the, the problem with new new properties and if you're buying off supposedly off plan you think you're getting a bargain but uh i my experience uh with a lot of people that i coach is that you don't it's a bit like driving a car off a forecourt you know um you think it's all beautiful and shiny and it's got this much value as soon as you drive it off the forecourt it's not got that value and also there's a risk really with the market the way it is you don't really know that it's going to maintain that value so I, I would say, you know, if you don't think that you're going to get the return on investment that you thought or that you were promised or there's something a little bit different to what you were promised when you first viewed it and you want to pull out, um, you know, there's probably a good reason to do that. But you have to find a reason, I think, rather than just go, oh, sorry, I can't do it anymore. But, you know, as, as Paul said, fine, look at the small print. Um, just make sure you don't get penalised hugely. Um, but, you know, I think off plan new builds, you know, always can be a bit, a bit tricky, but then in the current times, I'm certainly selling mine cheaper than I, um, than I wanted to. So you could pick up a bargain. So I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. Jenny, just on that point of view, there's two comment or two questions I've got. Uh, drum roll, please. Uh, the first one was about tradespeople. Obviously, you deal with landlords and tradespeople when you've got issues. What's your secret formula of managing uh, tradespeople? Because I always find them a bit of a nightmare. They tell you to do, you know, they're coming on a job, and then come Friday, if you go to the local pub, you know that's where they're going to be about two o'clock. Uh, apologies for all those tradespeople that don't drink, but for the majority. Um, how do you manage that process, uh, Jenny? Well, we've got a whole raft of trusted tradesmen. Um, we try and use the same people all the time. So the gas people, the electricity people, um, the, all, all of our key tradesmen we've worked with for years and years. And we have a fantastic arrangement with them. Uh, we can you know dole out the jobs to them they they make it very easy to work with they do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it they go into the properties courteously with the tenants they they access with with the management key or the key from the key safe make it very very easy to go in do the work and then they issue their bill and i pay it immediately because i know they've done the job that they've said that they're going to do now occasionally we have to find a new uh, tradesmen to work with and it's a nightmare it, it is a nightmare because there is such a um, uh, range of people's ideas of what's what's acceptable work-wise recently we've had to work with a new electrician because ours was shielding and he did recommend somebody for us to work with and even his recommendation I found it very difficult to work with the new guy because just because he didn't know the properties very well he didn't know uh he he worked differently he was very slow on invoicing it was very difficult to to get the information so that we could la give it on to the landlords because his communication was low uh, and that might have been because he was taking on a lot of work from our, our main electrician but uh, we have got a core of trusted a, a trusted tradesmen that we work with and we pay them immediately and we can I feel very comfortable calling them out in an emergency because I know that I always give them the best service that I can give them and they definitely do for me. The problem is when you've got to find somebody new, maybe you need a roofer and you're not really dealing with a roofer. You've got to go, I go through somewhere like check a trade, I look at uh, what their references are, I try always to get a, a recommendation. Um, but anybody I work with new, I then have to go in and check that they've done the job. I have to stand behind them almost to make sure that it's done to the quality that I expect, make sure it's done when they say, I have to tell the tenants when the tradesman's going in. So I need that tradesman to go in when he tells me he's going in. And I also need him to communicate with me. If something crops up, I liked, I'm a visual person. I like to get a lot of photographs back, show me what's going on. And if you're gonna repair something, I wanna see a before and after. Um, so new people, I'm right on it uh, because you need to be, otherwise you don't know whether they've done a good job for you. But if you've got a, a a, a team a great team of trusted tradesmen that takes a whole load of worry away because you know that if you've asked them to do a job they'll do that job and if they come across any problems you know they'll communicate with you so we operate in a relatively small area and that means we can use you know the same team of tradesmen it's not like we're spread uh, although we do work in Southampton and Portsmouth and I don't necessarily my port my, my Southampton people don't like going to Portsmouth 
uh, mostly because they can't park when they get there. Um, but the team of tradesmen I've got have been with us for a long time, and I think it's worth keeping good tradesmen who you know are not going to rip you off. Mm. Um, I, I sorry, just a thought in my head when you talked about pitches and and tradespeople, it's almost as though you've got to have a, a, a review of their work. And uh, I just thought of a new app. It, you could just swipe left. Uh, <laughs> um so we could accept that one um you talked about before the session started was the epcs uh so yes. what's the update on that one well up until now um well relatively recently we all had to achieve an e on an epc um and we were uh needing to pay a maximum of 3500 to bring our properties up to an e and if uh if we couldn't do it within that budget then we could probably get a dispensation. Um, there's talk right now, it's all going through consultation, that private rental sector housing needs to be an C, uh, um, grade C EPC, by 2025 for new tenancies and 2028 for existing tenancies. Now, the cap is 10,000 pounds on expenditure. So they're expecting us as landlords to bring our properties from an E to a C at our own expense up to about 10,000 pounds. Now, if you take this, look at, look at, the, look at Portsmouth as, a, as an example, it's full of Victorian terraces, rows and rows and rows of them. I would say it's probably somewhere close to impossible to get one of those to a C because of the style of building. But what are we gonna do? With there is fines of up to 30,000 pounds for not achieving it, um, if, you're, if you're still renting them. And also there's a suggestion that the tenants can claim compensation for, from you for the excess cost of uh, living in a property that doesn't meet the, uh, the C criteria. So this is really difficult, really difficult for us. Um, what they're also suggesting, takes it one step further, is that not only a C in the headline um, of the EPC, but a C in the carbon emissions. Now, there's a cap on the expenditure of 15,000 pounds where we might have to spend to get our properties to go to this level. Um, if that happens, at the moment, there's a green deal. But the government have, have said, well, you know, we'll help you. We'll help you get your properties up to a standard. However, the suggestion, not having read all of the detail on it, is that there's a primary and a secondary um, process within this Green Deal. The primary process, which you have to go through first, you need to get either um, a low carbon heating, such as ground or air source heating, heat pumps um, and, and um, insulation. And, and that has got to be done before there's going to be any kind of grant available to do windows, doors, draft proofing and the, the normal stuff that we might think about if we were thinking about upgrading our homes for, uh, to, to get a higher EPC. So the Green Deal sounds to me very much like it's pushing people to do stuff that we're not used to. Um, ground and air source heat pumps, well, try and stick that in a row of terraced houses in a, in a town centre. I think that's going to be very difficult to achieve. And it, it, the consultation's on now. And I think it's very scary because a lot of properties will not be achievable to get to a C just because they're old. What are we going to do? Our landlord's going to sell up. I, I suspect a lot will because they, they're not going to be allowed to rent these properties if this becomes law. If they sell up, where do people live? And currently, it's only suggesting this is going to happen in the private rental sector, not across the whole of the housing market. So there's a lot, lot of stuff there that's a bit scary. Who's going to police it? You know, that's that's the big thing. Um, I think local authorities probably will police it. Yeah, yeah I'm sure they will. You know, if you're advertising a property, you've got to put the EPC up there. And if yeah. you put an EPC up there that's got a D or an E. Yeah. I think that we know we can source some great stuff from Paul, though, can't we? You do. Do you yes. do air source heat pumps? Go, Paul. Paul? Yeah. Actually, the other thing I don't, but I know who a man, a man who does. Nobody does. Okay. 
Simon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, le the lender will ask when you come to do a remortgage. Oh, will he? Yeah, of course he will. Yeah. So, uh, um, it, it will be policed in that fashion as well. Oh, that's crazy, isn't it? So, can we can we participate? Can we actually um, put out give our views in this consultation? Do um, you know. I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> this is all very, very new, but yeah. it's very scary because I, I think a, a C is, is quite unachievable in many situations. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jenny, just one question from Paddy Lennox, um, who hopefully he's got his own YouTube channel going. I did ask you to do that, Paddy. Uh, it says, hi, Jenny, does serving a Section 13 after serving Section 21 work? Um, I'm not quite sure why you do a section 13 after you've done section 21. Let me tell you, and section 13 is a rent increase. So if you've, if you've done a section 21, that means you've asked your tenant to leave. So why would you then do a rent increase? Probably the more normal way would be you, you'd, you'd do the section 13 to get a rent increase in place and the tenant would go, I'm not paying that. I'm giving you notice and I'm leaving. I mm. can't see why you would do it the other way around. Yeah, no. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Paddy, maybe if you can come back to us on that point, uh, we'll, we'll ask the question on that. Um, there's always a good question from Deepak, um, and this again came way before the uh, booking on the old system, but uh, Deepak says, which method is the best and quickest way to conduct a cost benefit analysis to compare the increased mortgage costs compared to the potential tax savings for newly incorporated SPVs? And the answer to that is with great difficulty uh, because you, uh, Simon Hodgson's pointing the, the wrong way, I'm afraid. Uh, you're pointing to him with a mirror. Um, I think that there's, there's always a good challenge. And Simon, you can come on for a second if you don't mind. But the, the whole point of people, I, I had a consultation today and it was an hour and a half consultation. And the whole remit of the conversation is should I incorporate? And in their, their particular situation, and I, and I must stress their particular situation, so it's not generic, as Simon Hodgson said earlier, is they should not use a limited company to incorporate. So yes, they could mitigate CGT. Yes, they could mitigate SDLT. But they wanted money out of the limited company. The interest rates that they had in their prop, in personal names were very, very low. And when they compared that to the rate mortgage interest rates in a limited company, which were a lot higher, 1.5, 1.7% more in their personal names because of the mortgage broker gave them the details, and the fact that they want to extract money out of a limited company, actually, it they were worse off. So people always talk about, again, Facebook groups are brilliant for this. Use a limited company because you save tax, but then they don't take into account mortgage interest costs. So it's almost as though every time this question comes up, I do feel like I'm getting on my high horse um, and, and talk about rear ends. Simon, uh, what's your thinking of, of mortgage interests and, uh, you know, using a limited company? Do, do you know what? I, I, yeah, I, I'm sure within your consultation today for an hour and a half that you were wishing, my word, I wish there was a spreadsheet that, that gave a magic formula and spat the answer out at the other end. The, the, the hard and fast answer is there isn't. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a case of um, your individual tax and personal circumstances, the type of asset you've got, um, the type of tenants that will be in the building. So then match that then to the right lender. And then we then go, right, OK, well, well the lending for that property type will attract that kind of interest. OK, maybe that type of property might, might be better placed in a limited company. Um, but yeah, crikey. I see, I see Bronwyn almost like she's at the starter's gate, um, ready for the uh, shotgun. Uh, what's, what's your view to Bronwyn? Because obviously you incorporated. What was the reason for you incorporating and what was the nagging doubts that you might have had at the time? Well, my goodness. So I've been investing for seven years now. Um, and when I started, um, Section 24 hadn't come in, so that so it wasn't really this issue about offsetting mortgage interest rate. Um, and then, of course, it came in after 12 months, and we've been buying in joint names. 
And we thought, well, that's fine. We'll set up a limited company um, and we'll just keep those properties in joint names. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely fine. Uh, as we've grown and got bigger, we've got different limited companies for joint ventures or for our guest house business. Um, we've got, um, we've, we try and keep ourselves you know, in the bracket where we don't have to pay high rate tax because there's lots of ways of doing that. And of course, I work with the best uh, advisors around in tax. Oh, Optimize. And uh, so we were, I went to we went to Optimize and we, we, we speak regularly and we talk about, you know, what does our portfolio look like now? Um, it was quite messy with limited companies. We've mixed our one of our limited companies with the trading guest house business and some um uh residential single lets and it just is not great from a bookkeeping point of view um so we thought well let's let's consolidate here and why don't we while we're doing that look at the, the ones in private names and put those into a limited company and and we were able to do that with the best advisors we could possibly get and um and the, yeah, the reason is it's it's simple. It's the right stage of our business to do it. We didn't have to pay the stamp duty and all the complexity of of moving because we were effectively were a partnership in our business because we were buying them as a business when we first started. So yeah, it took us about actually it didn't take us a huge amount of time. There's a lot of talking about it, a lot of preparation, a lot of structure charts. Um, and a lot of information sharing. But when once we clicked the button, yes, let's do it, only took about three months, Simon. So that was great, you know. Um, and it just is just simpler for us as a business, but that's our business, not somebody else's. So I never recommend buying in a limited company unless you've, you've been through that thought process properly with an expert. So um, yeah, as your spotlight on the experts, um, recording shows so if anyone wants to see that i'm happy to share to share that particular um, event i think we spent we took over an hour Simon, on there's some noise going in the background I'm not sure what that is not not my end <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I, I tell you what, if you could uh, share that link that would be good so, uh, paul you've got your hand up was that because you want to interject yeah, I just okay, expand on uh, personal experience. I I saw deliberated for absolutely ages on uh, whether to incorporate, whether to LLP, whether to say a sole trader, and in the end, I went down the what, um, which I'm sure you're aware of, uh, Simon, is uh, the hybrid route of having an LLP with a limited company in it. So that's the way I went, but that's because I've got a substantial portfolio. And also had a, a severe loss making uh, company, uh, property company in the, uh, as a limited company already set up. So that was great for me. Um, so, but that's as, a, as I said, and, and as Bronwyn said, this is personal and it works, you know, it worked for our particular circumstances. I've actually had uh, two questions on Facebook group come through to me, if you, if you don't mind. Go for um, it. One is uh, I've had an inquiry and it's really for Simon Hudson. Uh, are there many lenders out there who will allow three contributors onto the mortgage? And that's because uh, they can't afford, between two of them, they can't afford it. So they're looking for a third. And to top it up, it is a relative by the looks of things. So uh, is that, are there people out there who are willing to lend at the moment? Uh, this sounds very much like it's a residential mortgage for a house to, to live in rather than as an investment. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, right, okay. Um, Yes, there are. There are lenders out there that can do it. Not as many as there were pre-lockdown. Potentially, the, the third person can stand as guarantor. Um, it will come down to the living arrangements, I guess. Because of course, what we don't know is whether all three people are going to be in the house at the same time or not. Or whether they've <laughs> got their own residence. Uh, I don't think I, I address that question, so <laughs> that's, that's for another Zoom meeting, I think. <laughs> uh, and the second one in is, is uh, Simon, you, you're not taking your Prozac. And is that because that, of all the tax questions, because you're looking very miserable, or is it because <laughs> your favourite football team got stuff last night? Oh, here we go. Who said that? I don't know. We're off the villa. <laughs> I think that was you, you muppet. Right, so we'll move on from that. I will uh, ban him from any question going from uh, going forward. So... Uh, Apologies for the uh, Muppet uh, phrase. 
the Muppets are actually quite entertaining. And you can bugger off as well, Tim, with that seven two. Um, as I, someone sent me a message, funny enough, saying one of my friends saying, uh, "Oh, you, you do know that PM said you should only let six in," which is nice to say that we let in seven. Um, anyway, so we'll move on from that, shall we? Thank you very much. Uh, so, Simon, back to you. I'll find a challenging question for Paul Hilliard in a second. Uh, Simon Hodson, I'm buying it. This is from Azad, by the way. Um, I'm buying an ex local authority flat in a block that majority is owned by the council. My broker told me that there are no lenders who are lending on ex council flats. How true is this? There are 115 years remaining. Right. Um, Which is but Paul's age. Th th this will come down to whereabouts in the country it is. Um, yeah, it, it, in under normal circumstances, if it's outside of London, in, in a, a mainly council-owned block of flats, and you're trying to get a mortgage, it is particularly difficult to get, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, in, in London, it's easier because of the value of, of, of the property. Um, and then what will, it will also come down to are the number of um, floors in the building, the number of lifts serving the, the building, uh, and then the number, the number of floor that the particular flat in the building sits in. It's a minefield, to be honest. Um, but happy to look at it and see if I can help. But yeah, we need to know whereabouts in the country it is. That, that will determine how likely a mortgage is going to be for it. What if the flat was on a floodplain? Oh, well, uh, 3A or 3B? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I tell you what, um, yeah, flat on the fifth floor in a floodplain would be quite something, I think. <laughs> well, what about the cladding on the building? You know, the, the, some of these council properties, you know, insurance and stuff might be an issue too. It's, it's, only, it's not just council buildings. There, no. Are blocks of new builds in London, okay, mm -hmm. who, who we are struggling to get remortgages on because they've still got old style cladding yeah. and their risk assessments have not been finalized and carried out. So, therefore, yeah, they can't make any kind of balanced decision. Oh, tricky, tricky, tricky. Um, that's a lot of fun. There we are. We've got the flood one in there, so well done, Simon. Oh, I thought I'd do that. Uh, so, for anyone listening in, obviously, um, do make sure you ask your questions. If you're liking this session, then give us a like on YouTube. That really does help with the YouTube algorithm. Also, my mentor tells me. Um, so do tell us if this is enjoyable. Give us a like. Also, make sure that you ask your questions. It is live. We'll, we'll be able to answer the majority of those questions that are coming through, even though it's 10 past uh, 8. Uh, Paul, over to you. There's a question here. Are the fees for LMPG a one-off, or can it be paid monthly? Uh, the, I didn't hear that, that final bit, but uh, uh, the, the fees are very reasonable. Uh, they start from 199 plus VAT up to 399 plus VAT. Uh, so up to three properties, it's 199. Uh, up to 25 properties, it's 299. And if you like Simon Hudson and uh, sorry, Simon Mizovich, and I've got nearly 100 plus there. <laughs> What's that? How many goals you scored last night, Simon? <laughs> Um, so, uh, yes, the, uh, the uh, fees uh, are annual. The one thing that we say is that uh, if it, we like it to be a win-win-win for everybody. So if you don't, uh, you know, if you start off with the intention of having a project and you don't do the project, then you can, uh, at the end of the year, if you've not saved your membership in any year, you can apply for a free membership the following year and continue to have that free membership until you do start saving. So obviously when you start your projects again, then you'll start saving again. So uh, we don't do uh, annual, sorry, monthly memberships because unfortunately uh, uh, when we uh, looked at it, uh, there were some people, you know, a couple of people tried it and took advantage of us. And it's just not worth upsetting people. Uh, so uh, we decided we'd stick with the annual, annual formula uh, annual payments, uh, but obviously, if you don't save, you get your uh, a free membership until you do start saving. And don't forget, you do get access to 
both insurance and uh, legal services. So uh, we have the likes of Tim Bishop, Spinal Lacken Bishop, uh, as one of our service providers for solicitors. So always remember that, that you get access to the best at very reasonable prices. Just out of interest as a group, who in the room just has got uh, LMPG? Just raise your hands if you've got LMPG membership. Yeah, so, I mean, if that's all the panel members with LMPG membership, surely you should be using that. Um, so make sure you do get some savings. And hopefully one day, uh, you know, Paul might be able to buy a better top, but uh, that, that uh, leads to remain undecided. Um, the next question we've got here is, uh, we talked about, as I've got another question actually. Wow, this one is at Tim. Uh, I'm buying a duplex apartment with ground rent of 250 pounds per year. The freeholder is not willing to accept changes with the deed of variation. The ground rent is increasing every 10 years as is linked to RPI. My solicitor is not willing to complete the transaction as he thinks the property will not be marketable in the future. What is your opinion on this? Uh, number one, uh, we don't, well, I think most important is we simply have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Um, the solicitor who may or may not know what he's talking about is obviously referring to leasehold reform. Now, to give you an example, um, the government came up, sorry, the Law Commission came out about two months ago uh, and produced some recommendations on right to manage, lease extension and common hold. There were something like over 100 uh, recommendations on each of those. These are only recommendations. We have no idea whether the government will take some of them, all of them or none of them. If it does, no one knows when. My gut feeling from what I've spoken to other people, probably if something does happen, it probably won't happen before 2022, 23. And even then, we have absolutely no idea. And fundamentally, even even if they do change the rules on actually the ground rent you can charge, uh, it's quite unlikely, I think, that they're going to be able to backdate it for every single flat that exists already. It's something like four or five million flats in the country, and you simply sort of can't go out wiping every freeholder's value. So uh, none of us really know. Um, you could certainly hands and wait two or three years to see if it does or doesn't come up uh, come about. I would have thought it's pretty unlikely the government will take all these um, uh, into account. And I think it's pretty unlikely they're going to go backwards. So ultimately, you've got a choice. You either buy something now or you wait for two or three years on the off chance the government might move in your direction. If they don't, um, even if they do, I think you'll have, you'll have possibly a dual market. You'll have the, the new ones, which perhaps no, no ground rent, and the old ones where there is ground rent. And there'll have to be a variation in price on that. Um, but as for RPI, RPI at ten, uh, over 10 years, that's quite common. In fact, that's quite reasonable these days. What was, what's been complained about is what was more common 10, 20, 30 years ago. Now, I'm almost as old as Paul Hilliard, but not quite. You know, um, I, I'm in my, you know, my late 80s really but anyway in 1970s inflation was um quite commonly uh, you know at a very high level 10 15 20 30 percent whatever uh, and certainly over 10 years it wasn't un it wasn't unusual for there to be uh, an increase effective double uh, over those that period so therefore they were much much worse and some of those are still in play and they're the controversial ones ones that double every 10 years so actually rpi which is currently running at about one and a half percent is not a big issue so the rpi thing is, is perfectly reasonable perfectly standard uh, most people are buying flat with exactly those kind of conditions you almost certainly won't get a landlord to change under a deed of variation which we deal with um so i, I guess you could sit on your hands um but i certainly as, as our solicitors we were dealing with these things regularly we would not advise people not to go ahead it's your decision we have no idea whether the law commission's proposals will come into effect but it won't be for a while and i don't think it'll have the catastrophic effect your solicitor seems to think it does even if he does ultimately it's your decision it's your decision actually i'm going to take a risk as long as he explains could go this way could go that way that i think ultimately clients ha have the right to you know to, to say yes i want to do that regardless of your advice solicitors are sometimes wrong mm. i mean talk about solicitors uh, there's a question here it may be more my ball cart but uh, my ball cart if you like but martin oh, started question uh, for tim bishop how much sdlt uh, i might be able to be in the position <laughs> to ask the question here um do i pay for my brother's share of inherited property value is 240 and my purchase price is 120 I do own another rental property. The simple answer to that one, Martin, is if you're buying a property for someone else, you will not have to pay the SELT on the banded rate up to 500,000. So you don't have to pay that, but you are likely to pay the 3% SELT high rate as a result of already owning a property in your own name. So that should be a, a relatively straightforward one for you. Um, Jenny, Paddy has come back 
about this whole section 21 and section 13. Uh, we need to sell the house. So we served a section 21. The social housing tenant is not moving anytime soon. In the meantime, the council top up of 200 pounds per calendar month has stopped and the council suggested we serve a section 13. Okay. Um, yes, that, so obviously this tenancy is not going to come to an end anytime soon. So yes, the reason you would do a section 13 for a rent increase is because it is then considered by the courts when it finally gets to court. If you simply said, I'm going to increase the rent, I don't know, from 600 to 650, and then everyone agreed it and they started paying that new rent. If it went to court, technically the, the, the judge could say, no, but the, on the contract, the original contract, the rent was 600, so that's all we're going to recognise. So if you're going to do a formal rent increase and you do it on a section 13, the courts have to recognise it. So I suspect this one, it sounds like it's going to go to court with social housing, trying to get rid of somebody for, you know, it might be for an extremely good reason you need your property back. Um, you have to do everything properly. And yes, in that case, I think I would most definitely recommend doing a section 13. Um, because it puts the paperwork in place and we will all talk about a paper trail when we get to court and that's the most important thing. I suspect you're probably up against the council telling these people to stay put until they're evicted because if they don't stay put they have in the eyes of the local authority made themselves voluntarily homeless and the system won't pick them up. This is where the system is completely wrong. Um, they, they tell people to stay in the house until there's a bailiff uh, uh, to, to literally throw them out. At that point, the council will pick them up again. So it puts people through an enormous amount of stress, not only the tenant, but also the landlord. And so um, I agree with you in that situation. Yeah, do a section 13, because you could be waiting a long time to get rid of these tenants. Mm. Uh, a question that's come from you. Thank you, Jenny, for that. Uh, a question that's come from Deepak uh, on YouTube Live has said, uh, are here mortgages for business limited companies are coming down. Uh, Simon, are you, are you seeing a, a, a decrease in mortgage interest rates in limited companies versus personal loans? Um, there have been a couple of lenders that have reduced interest rates um, towards the back end of uh, September. However, I would caveat that with um, said lenders, and I'm not going to name names on, on, on right now, um, have slightly tightened up their underwrites behind that. Okay, so what that says is, that as long as you've got a tight deal with a really good security, you can get access to that interest rate. However, um, if you haven't, you're not necessarily going to benefit from it. Um, are there going to be any more between now and Christmas? Uh, possibly. Um, a couple of other, other you know, limited company lenders have suggested that they are considering doing something within this month. Again, I can't name names. I've got to remain tight-lipped in, in, until it either does or doesn't come out. Um, you didn't do that last time. You, you kind of spilled the beans. Come on. I regretfully. <laughs> um, however, I can't see much more. Um, if, if there are, if there's a little tweak in, in rates with another couple of lenders, we will be getting close to where we were pre-lockdown. The only thing that we're missing is loan to value above 75%. And that doesn't look like it's coming back anytime soon for obvious reasons. If there is a change in the marketplace, it will be hard to consider that to be responsible lending at either 80 or 85% loan to value. Okay. Uh, some nice comments coming through YouTube. And uh, thanks to Tim uh, T., and to well, who said this is the best, most intelligent, most serious, and most professional property channel, excluding Paul Hip. Oh, no, no, they don't say that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and as as it said the same thing, and uh, uh, Martin also said, I agree with the last comment, the best property professional panel I've come across, always interesting and very informative, and bright tops as well. Um, <laughs> So that, uh, that's that side, uh, as I said, uh, at Simon Hodgson, uh, I think we're coming back to that uh, property question, actually, uh, who said, uh, as I also said, hi, thanks to Tim uh, for the answers he's provided. But he came back with si at Simon here saying the flat is in Northampton, ground floor, three, hold on, three floor building, 
no list, no balcony, no cladding. Brick build, thank you for your answer. I will contact you. Indeed, because what, what we'll need to do is a, a local area search, street view, have a look at the area and really find to see if there's any leverage that we can, can put forward with an application to a lender to get them to not give their default answer, which is no. Um, we'll have to see. Always worth a try. We like a challenge. Do you know, I've got to delay on my uh, I tablet. I'm just looking over there. And all I can see is Paul Hilliard showing 7-2. I mean, we talk, the word professional came up, Paul. You know, that's all I can say. Uh, there's only one P, professional. Um, it, what it says here, by the way, a uh, question from Stephanie uh, said, is it possible or worth trying to negotiate personal guarantees lenders, ask directors for limited companies for property purchase? I thought they were non-negotiable until one solicitor told me that we should try. Um, I mean, from your perspective, Simon, personal guarantees, is there such a thing nowadays? Uh, yeah, yeah. With, with, with any limited company lending, there's, you, you're going to be asked to give a personal guarantee. Um, I, I, I'll try and summarise it. If you borrow in your own name, you are 100% responsible for the whole of the loan. Yeah. If you take out a mortgage in a limited company, it, it is a limited liability company. So if you didn't give a personal guarantee as one of the directors and borrowers within you know, or shareholders of the company, effectively the debt would die with the limited company. So therefore your responsibility to the debt is just a cash input in terms of director's loan. So they take a personal guarantee. It's generally around 20%. Okay. It can be potentially negotiated with some lenders, not all lenders, but that would really come down to the size and the strength of the portfolio that is borrowing behind that as to whether a lender would consider it. Um, obviously, if you're a highly geared limited company, new start, there's no chance. Not, not so Simon, can I come in on that one in terms of personal guarantees? Um, we often get asked, or an issue that often comes up, is recommendations for solicitors in terms of personal guarantees. So perhaps I can just explain those, um, because there's always a lot of confusion why some people are you know, doing them really cheaply and some people are asking ridiculous sums. Um, the position is basically that it's really down to the bank. The bank asks you to do it basically because they want solicitors to provide insurance policy. So in other words, if you take out the loan and something goes pear-shaped and you default, and you say, but I didn't understand such and such, they'll be able to turn around, ah, oh, but actually your solicitor told you, sue your solicitor. So basically what they're doing, they insist you get independent legal advice to provide basically them with an unpaid for insurance policy. Now, solicitors who really understand risk know that actually this is a really quite risky business. Um, we know, for example, our insurance brokers and solicitors spend a lot of indemnity insurance, really, really hate this kind of work being done. So what you'll find is the very best firms on the whole either refuse to do that, that, that kind of advice at all, independent legal advice sort of personal guarantee, or charge at quite a high level. We charge at a high level and to be honest, usually I tell people to go somewhere cheaper. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're doing, I would strongly advise to go someone who does know what they're doing and really make sure you understand. However, if you're confident, 100% confident, you know what you're signing up to in a personal guarantee and you don't need that advice, then there's no problem with going cheap. But all I would say is if you do go cheap, bear in mind those cheap uh, solicitors don't understand risk. And if things go pear-shaped, they really have to be able to prove that they advised you individually, that, that they got clear records of exactly what they advised you, that you understood it, all those kind of things, which can't be done in 30 seconds. Um, so therefore, my advice to you is if, if you need advice and you don't understand it, go to a solicitor, be prepared to charge. But if you really are sure, like you guys, for example, you would understand the risk here, my fellow panel members, they may well decide to go and get a favour from someone or go cheap. But in doing so, so that solicitor does not understand risk. There you go. Another free bit of worth, advice for a solicitor. I know it's a rare thing. You can see the pigs flying across already. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Look, we're getting close to time. So what I'd like to do is final uh, to question really to for the future's bright, the future's orange, apart from Paul's top. Um, if you could don't mind concluding with your projections for 2021 we're already in october so let's talk about 2021 where you think the property prices will be next year and then bronwyn over to you with the same question but then for you to conclude and summarize on the points made tonight so paul first to you well as you say the future's bright uh, the one thing i guarantee is that there will be 12 months next year absolutely <laughs> guarantee that and uh, uh, some duty ends on March the 31st. Uh, prices next year, they'll be up and they'll be down and they'll be up. 
Uh, don't know where, don't know when, uh, but uh, yeah. I mean, seriously, I think uh, the uh, current strength of the market will keep the prices high. And as we've said earlier, that you know, auction prices are absolutely r ridiculous at the moment. They are retail prices. So if you're buying at auction, make sure you do due diligence. Um, as we intimated earlier, that Q2, Q Q3 next year, there, I'm sure there'll be a softening of the market. So if you can hold on till then, do so. But if it's uh, if it's you know if you get the right deal, go for it. Um, so that's as uh, as well an educated guess as uh, as any. Uh, I may be right, but then again, I may be wrong. But all I all I know is that the table doesn't lie, and Villa's second in the table. So over to you, Bronwyn. No, I'm going to go last, I think. Is that right? I'll come in here yeah, then. Last. Jenny. <laughs> yeah. I'm only going to come in here because I'm going to say the same as everybody else. So I thought I'd say it first because, <laughs> you know, what Paul said. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking right at the moment, property prices are a little bit high because there's a scramble for getting some property deals across the line um, before the end of the stamp duty and uh, as we've all said conveyancing has taken an awfully long time at, at the moment so people are going to want to be finished up buying by the end of January to make sure they're finished by the end of March their conveyancing so I think there's going to be this scramble then and we get towards the uh, 31st of March I think that there's going to be a bit of a dip people are not going to want to buy them because they they perceive that they're losing out because then they've got to pay stamp duty what I think is that this will affect residential purchases much more than investors because investors are going to buy. They're going to do the numbers. And if the numbers stack up, they're going to buy. And it doesn't matter to them whether they buy in the stamp duty holiday or whether they buy in the stamp duty cliff edge or whether they buy later next year. It's all about numbers. And so if you're an investor, do your due diligence. And if the numbers work, buy when the project's right for you. I think the stamp duty thing is going to affect homeowners much more than it's going to affect investors. That's my prediction for next year. Wrong one. Well, over to me. I thought I was going to go last. Okay. For me, uh, next year is, it seems like forever away. Um, the big thing to get geared up, ready for that deal is education. You've heard that so many times already today from all of us. You know, you've got to get that experience under your belt. You need to be, you need to be thinking about getting that advice and support before you do the deal so that you minimize your risks. That's really, really important. So um, education so that you can spot the good deal. Now, if you can find a motivated seller, I keep saying the same thing, if you can find somebody that needs to sell quickly, they have a situation, they need to resolve that. If you can help them and you can get the uh, a sort of below market value opportunity with added value plus prospects, then you don't need to wait to see those prices start to fall. You really don't because where are the motivated sellers? They're always out there. So I would keep looking, get that education. I can certainly help with that, uh, definitely help with that um, and work with experts. So that's what we proved today. Um, we have amazing experts and we enjoy what we do and we like to give advice, don't we? You know, this isn't costing anybody anything, this, this event. Um, it's just giving people advice and support. So yeah, don't forget in that, um, in that little chat box is my book. So again, if you haven't got an education yet and you want to find out how I can, uh, how I disappear into different countries, uh, that's my book on offer. If you go to that, that link at the uh, top of the chat box in YouTube. Okay, over to Simon. Which I'm one? just, well, because so it's- Are we time, running out of time? Time sufficient. Oh, we are. Uh, Simon will be there for like three months. Uh, he'll get his opportunity next time around. Okay. Uh, so, I was going to conclude with, it's now 8.30. We've got to be professional like the Beeb. Uh, Paul Hilliard works for ITV. Um, 2nd of November, that is the next Monday session that's going to be with us. So we will be sending emails out um, to say this, booking your next session. But do be sure to join us on the 2nd of November. Unfortunately, Bronwyn is around. Now, 
just before we close off, for, for people that begin to disappear off, tell us, Bronwyn, what, what are you doing uh, in terms of your, your trip? So my next uh, adventure is looming. So on Thursday, I will be flying out with John to Namibia to volunteer at a wildlife sanctuary out there. Um, they've got four reserves across the country. It is the most amazing place, uh, lots of animal research, and they're desperate for volunteers. They normally have about 28 on the main farm, the main reserve. They've got two at the moment. So John and I will have our work cut out, uh, working with different animals, cheetah, baboon, um, meerkats, uh, leopard. Yeah, monkey Paul Hilliard who are going on to Innie's looking after. I should be able to join you. Um, I should be able to join you next time in November and I'll see what sort of backdrop I can have. Um, although the time time difference is, <laughs> is very little, so it might be dark. <laughs> Behind me is a cheetah. <laughs> anyway, yes, that's about my dream life. That's what my book's all about. How do I create the freedom to do these things? And it's all about you guys. Um, I, couldn't do, I couldn't do this stuff without having experts helping manage my properties and support me. So thank you, everybody. Until next time around, guys, thank you ever so much for joining. And don't forget, 2nd of November, we'll all see you again soon. Cheerio. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Okay, I've ended that. So, Sam Hudson's got.